in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm David Lawrence, and we have the high honor and privilege today of interviewing a very distinguished member of our community, Mr. Elliot Galloway. He's a native of Moultrie, Georgia, a graduate of Wake Forest University, and he came to Atlanta to teach at the Westminster Schools and then founded the Galloway School in 1969, which bears his name. And Mr. Galloway had a distinguished career in the military, and I'm going to turn it over to him and let him talk about what it was like growing up in the Depression and going off to college where he was on Pearl Harbor Day and what happened after that. Elliot, take off. Well, being raised in South Georgia during the Depression was an experience which I'll never forget. But because of the community that I grew up in, everybody helped everybody else. And uh, there wasn't a great deal of, of hunger going on. Uh, for instance, I had an uncle who had uh, watermelons, and he would bring watermelons uh, from his patch and put on the front lawn of our house and encourage all people to come and pick them up. But we didn't have anything, but we had uh, plenty to eat because of the farm, and uh, we had a, a wonderful feeling of supporting each other. And uh, I played football and baseball and basketball in high school, and uh, when the time came to go to college, nobody in my family had ever been, and my father had uh, uh, nine brothers and sisters, and they all had a lot of children, and I was the first one to, of all of my cousins to graduate from high school. And it was due, of course, to my father's interest, and my father uh, wanted an education, but probably got about a sixth grade education. So when the time came for me to go to college, uh, I got a partial scholarship to Wake Forest, and uh, I worked in the boarding house, and I did all the things that needed to do to survive in college. And uh, I, it was a wonderful experience, uh, and uh, I enjoyed my experience in college. And then uh, we were having the Christmas dance in December of 1941. And my date, who has now been my wife for 62 years, uh, were going back to the fraternity house to, uh, before she went back to college that day. She went to uh, University of North Carolina at Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. And a friend of mine came running out of the fraternity house and said that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, I didn't know where Pearl Harbor was, and uh, I found out later on. And uh, most of my friends uh, either got into some kind of officer training program, or they volunteered immediately. Well, I volunteered in early January for the Marine Corps uh, office of training program where you could finish uh, college and then go into office of training. As a sideline there, there were 11 of us who went over there to take the examination. And I was the only one who failed. And uh, I was very depressed because my father had been in World War One, and my great-great-grandfathers had been in the, the uh, Civil War, and I had one great-great-grandfather who was in the Revolutionary War, and I heard those stories uh, all along, and although I didn't think that I'd ever had anything to do with the military, but at that time I wanted to because I thought it would last about six months, and I wanted to have some of those experiences that my uncle and my father had had in France. Well. I didn't know what I was going to do, but anyhow, they came around looking for people to uh, do certain things, 
and Gene Tooney, who was a uh, professional boxer, had a program of physical fitness, and they wanted to get young athletes to go on active duty to help with the training of recruits. Well, I immediately volunteered, and two weeks later, I was ordered to Norfolk for training. And I uh, went and uh, I enjoyed it. I was in good shape, and I was, uh, had, was captain of the track team and the cross-country team, and I played football earlier. And one little story is that uh, I got hurt in spring practice, and the football coach said uh, uh, that uh, I would run with the track team, and that built up my knee because sometimes knees were, in those days, they didn't do a very good job or know what to do with them. So uh, he said, you're not much of a football player anyhow. So I went out and that started me uh, on a lifelong joy of running. But I, I, I was ordered to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, to the Aviation Protecting Trainer Center, uh, as an instructor. And I was there, and one of my very good friends that I'd worked at Camp Ridgecrest for boys before the war was in the lead plane that went into Pulaski. And, and we, we don't know what happened. They never found his body, but the, one of the theories is that he was, uh, they came low over the Pulaski oil fields and they hit one of the oil wells and it blew the plane up. And that caused me to think differently. I wanted to, to get involved in something that was going on. So I volunteered, and, uh, and, but in, and they sent me to be with Fleet Air Wing 16 that was doing submarine patrol uh, in the uh, Atlantic, and uh, uh, the, they, they had started sending convoys down off South America over to Ascension Islands and then up to England, and then we could have plane and destroyer escort, and we didn't lose many ships. Well, that was exciting, and that was uh, important. Uh, to get this experience because we did get some blockade runners and we did sink some, uh, uh, some submarines and uh, it was uh, uh, a situation where uh, I wanted, to, still wanted more than I was getting down there. And a good friend of mine who was the line coach uh, at Georgia Tech, Matt Thorpe, was killed. And so I really put pressure uh, on the Bureau of Naval Personnel to let me uh, get a destroyer because I always put down on a fitness report that I wanted to destroy it. And so in 1941, or 1944, I got a destroyer, the USS Airwind DD 355. And uh, I got to go to the Pacific. I uh, identify somewhat with uh, Henry Fonda and Mr. Roberts because uh, Mr. Roberts uh, uh, wanted to get into it. And he was on a, a supply ship sitting out there in the Pacific. And finally, if you've seen the movie, uh, he finally got it. And he got to Okinawa and got involved, but his, uh, he was sitting in the wardroom of the destroyer and the kamikaze hit the ship and uh, Mr. Roberts was killed. Well, I didn't get killed, but I certainly got into typhoons and I got into, uh, in, into uh, uh, the, uh, the, the kamikazes and uh, then later on, we went down and picked up some of the survivors from the Indianapolis, the cruiser that was sunk toward the end of the war. Now, that was 
it's primarily the outline of what I did. And uh, I think there's two or three things that stand out in my mind as I examine it. I, William James says that what you do, you take things as they are and you make the best you can of that. And I think that's what I did. I got involved in, in various activities to improve the morale aboard our ship. And uh, we did uh, a lot of things that were uh, very important, uh, I think, uh, for the war effort. Now, um, the, the Okinawa situation was one that I reflect on many times, and from time to time I have dreamed about some of the things that happened. And I think that one of them was uh, when I first came aboard ship, they were, I was a junior officer and I uh, was assigned the top bunk and I had to crawl up and barely could uh, it was turn over uh, when, uh, when I got in my bunk. And uh, I was up there and one of the senior officers who was in the room with me came in and we had a little uh, places where you could put your valuables in and he was undoing the little safe and I said, what you doing? He said, well, we were in a typhoon, and if I were you, I'd get up and I'd go topside. Well, I got up and I went topside, but they encouraged us not to go topside because they didn't want the uh, ship to get top heavy. And if what happened to the class of destroyers that I was on, they were, the, uh, they were built in the 30s. And therefore, they did not have the ballot in their uh, in the ship, and they had added all this fire control gear on the uh, on the top side, and the ship was already top heavy. So uh, this is why three of the ships were lost in the storm that was held on December the. Uh, the uh, 17th, 1944, and, and we uh, had to undergo some of the same things, and the Pittsburgh lost its power, the Duluth uh, lost, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, it was uh, the 46th frame, it didn't lose its power, but they were taking water. So many times in the Navy, it is the See itself sometimes that is an enemy. So the, the friendship that I made in those years during World War II is still very, very important to me. Occasionally I'll get a telephone call from the airport, somebody who's passing through uh, Atlanta and they know that started the Galloway School, so they can look it up in the phone book and give me a call. And every night I would get a letter from a son or from a wife or uh, one of these who, youngster, who uh, passed on to their reward, and it's always uh, a sad situation. And I, I, I believe that World War II is something that I will never forget. It was something that I glad I volunteered. Uh, I kept my reserve commission and uh, I was recalled for active duty uh, for Korea and spent two years uh, on an oil tanker, a fuel, a fuel uh, at fuels at sea. And then I 
after coming back to Atlanta, I went, I was at Westminster and I kept my reserve commission. And they asked me on four, five summers to run a training program for the for officers and sailors who were going to be in now aboard the uh, Lexington. And that was an enjoyable experience. But when I come to think about this situation that we're in now, uh, I realize that I don't completely understand. But the thing that was so clear on that December the seventh day uh, was for me to volunteer for active duty and finish uh, this thing as quickly as possible because of what we had to undergo. So, as I reflect on it and as I go through the memorabilia uh, and look at the things that, that uh, bring back those memories, uh, I think about several things. And one is uh, my good friend uh, who was killed at Palazzi, which gave me a desire to become as involved as I possibly could. And, and Mac Thorpe, who was coaching at Tech, and he was coaching. I played in the first uh, All-State football game that was played in 1938. And uh, Mac was the line coach, and he became, he's also from Moultrie. And, uh, and, and losing those two people uh, gave me motivation to become involved in any activity that I could to bring about the end of the war as soon as possible. Elliot, did you have much fear in the typhoons or when you were being attacked by kamikaze pilots? Did, did I what happened? Have much fear when you were being oh, that I did. I mean, I was, I was on the bridge on several occasions when kamikazes came over and dived on ships on the right and sometimes on the left. And I was scared. And, uh, but, but I think that the thing that was important, uh, going back to William James again, you accept things as they are and do the best you can with them. How did you feel about the boys, the Japanese boys who were dr piloting those kamikaze pilot airplanes? You're a deeply spiritual person. You made such a wonderful contribution to not only the academic development of this community, but to the spiritual development of this community. How did you feel about the Japanese feeling of not caring about their lives compared to ours? Well, in my, my, of course, I really didn't know what those kamikazes were doing. Part of my training going aboard uh, the Airwin was that I uh, was going to be, I'd been assigned to the gunnery department. So I went back to Pearl Harbor and, and they sent us back there to get some training on what to do about the kamikaze. And so, you know, I, I felt uh, growing up with my father and my father was on the draft board from the time it started in Moultrie until the time it ended. And, 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 and I, w I grew up with the idea that the Germans and the Japanese were our enemies. And that this country, if it's going to survive, we had to do what we had to do. And uh, I, I, I didn't think much about that. I just, I just wanted to... Well, uh, my oldest son was born while I was uh, uh, on, on the Airwin uh, in the Pacific, and I named him for my friend who was killed at Palestine. Uh, and uh, this is Jeff. This is Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, that's right. And he uh, and uh, and you know, I, I really I didn't because now I. I one thing that I, I do believe 
that morning, when we went down to pick up survivors from the Indianapolis, and as far as you could see almost, there were, that's the most horrible experience I had, was uh, bodies on the water. And they, uh, and, the, and, the, and it was just as calm as it could be. And the, and the, the sharks were having a field day with these bodies. And we put boats in the water, and I, I had one of them, and we went over and we picked up, we picked up five bodies uh, on, the, on the boat that I was in charge of. And, uh, and, and the, the, I thought at that time, more or less from a spiritual point of view, gosh, if I thought it'd be different than this, and I did feel that our young man who had had this horrible thing happen to them. And, and I said, we ought to have a better way of settling the situation. I was going through San Francisco when the United Nations was being organized. And I said, oh, this is wonderful. And, and, and I felt that I really wanted to do something. So this leads me into what I decided to do, is to go to uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York City and take graduate work at Union and at uh, Columbia. And, uh, and, and that's what I did. And it turned my life around to do what I've been trying to do all these years and uh, involved with the church and involved with trying to get young people uh, into the uh, right way of mind, body, and soul. Why don't you tell them what Jeff did, who you named after your friend. Mention what Jeff accomplished with his life. Well, he, uh, he's a young fellow and uh, he uh, he was at uh, Westminster and uh, he was running a track meet that night and in the morning he had, uh, he was on the swim team and they won the state championship and then that night uh, he had a good night at the track meet. It was a, a, a relay situation and he said, well, Dad, I don't think I want to do all these things. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I'm dead. So he said, well, I said, what do you want to do? He said, well, I think I'd like to run and uh, go to the Olympics. And that, he was a ninth grader at that time. And so he did. And uh, he uh, uh, went to uh, Wesleyan in Connecticut and uh, then Vietnam came along, and uh, so he volunteered for the Naval Reserve training program, and, and he was at, uh, the, uh, uh, in the same officer candidate uh, class that the, uh, Curry was in at that time. He didn't know him, he didn't, because uh, it was a big group. And uh, so he went to Vietnam and had uh, two years of to a duty out there, and then he came back, went to graduate school, and continued his running, and in 1972, he made the Olympic team, and that was a great uh, time for my family to have him do that. Well, you should be proud of him. Well, we're proud of him. You should be proud of all your children. And so, uh, the general constitution called up the next day and said, how does it feel to have a son on the Olympic team? He said, well, she said, it couldn't happen to a nicer person, so that's how we feel. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot, you went into the Korean War, which is the first limited war the United States has fought compared to World War II, which was a global encounter with, it was an all-out win situation. And since World War II, we've been in limited wars to where we've just tried to occupy a certain area of the 
uh, foreign land, and yet we've not tried to overwhelmingly defeat anybody. That's been true of, of Korea, Vietnam, and now the Middle East. How do you feel about these limited wars we're fighting as opposed to trying to take on the whole shebang? Well, I'm <coughs> in a different place than I was in December of 1941. Uh, and uh, then, and, and, and again, I go back to the Indianapolis situation, because that was such a horrible thing uh, to, to happen to these people. There were 1,200 people aboard the cruise, and only three of them, only 300 of them, got off alive. Only two officers, the skipper and an ensign, were the only two officers that survived. So I, I look at it with the idea, and as an idealist, hoping that we can find a better way to solve our problems. And, and it looks like that we, we are still having trouble to do that. So, uh, and particularly, in, I, I later on was a commanding officer of a, of a transport during the occupation going from New York to Bremerhaven once a month. And uh, one night, uh, the admiral who was in charge of a certain amount of, of uh, you know, trying to hear what was going on over, over there, and he came, I had a off of my cabin, I had a reception room, and I was supposed to entertain the senior officers. And so he came up there, and he said two things that I think that are important. He said that he's afraid there's not enough people who love the republic that are going to keep this uh, country safe. And he also said that he had been in charge of listening stations where we had enough, we didn't have enough troops uh, in Germany or France to uh, defend if the Russians wanted to attack us. But we were able to break the code and they could listen and hear these things that were going on and we could do little things that would cut this down. And by having that experience, he said, was better than having an all-out war. And he said, we, we made a mistake in Korea when we went there and then the Chinese came into the, the war and so therefore, we had to settle. Now, that Vietnam hadn't started then, so we don't, but when, when I thought about that, when the Russians uh, failed to, to uh, do the, some of the things they wanted to, and more or less, I think, went broke. And, uh, and so, uh, they had that experience. Now, I don't want to get into this situation right now, but I think that it's something we have to take a good look at to see how much we can afford to do all the things that we are doing by ourselves. Now, that's a long answer to your question, but I think basically what I'm saying is that I, as I stood on, on that the boat picking up those survivors for the Indianapolis, I, I wish we could find a better way to solve our problems. Elliot, I've always been impressed with the graduation ceremony at Galloway School <clears throat> where each student is asked to bring a flower of his choosing or her choosing and put in a vase that you set at the front of the auditorium and at the end of the graduation ceremony after all the children have come up, there's a flower arrangement where representing each different person as a different flower. And I'm just wondering if the impetus for that kind of a ceremony didn't come from your desire to see the world solve its problems, uh, recognizing differences and dialoguing with each other from the Indianapolis experience. 
Well, absolutely, because uh, I, I, I believe that it's, it's two things that we would like to help our children accomplish. Uh, one is freedom, and the other one is responsibility. And, and I think that they need to come together. I, I'm glad when we uh, win a soccer game or a basketball game or things like that, but the idea of competing and being involved and teamwork and this little symbol that we have at graduation is one of those ways that makes it point that all for one and one for all. What, uh, did, by chance, did you know William Manchester when Jeff was at Westland? Yes. Did you ever have any conversations with Dr. Manchester about his experiences in World War II? I didn't, but I met him at, at Jeff's graduation, and I have read most of the things that he has written. And uh, I think that uh, when he went back to the, one of the late books that he wrote, uh, I, I, it, 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 uh, he's always inspired me. Goodbye darkness. Right. Goodbye darkness. Yes, was right. When he went back and. Yeah. That's right. Would you comment on your relationship with Kitty during the war? What it was like to be married and split up from your bride and have yeah. children born when you weren't home? Well, we have been married. We'll be uh, 62 years. It'll be, uh, it was, uh, and we'll have our 65th third anniversary on May the 16th. Now, when we uh, were there together on the seventh day of, uh, of December 1941, and uh, we looked at it as exciting and things, so I would had to make a, we had to make a decision, not me. We had to make a decision. Were we going to get married or not? Well, I first had orders to go to a, uh, a ship that I wanted to go to, but they changed my orders. So, but we set our marriage up for 16th of May, 1942. And she, of course, uh, is uh, the most wonderful person that uh, I have enjoyed knowing and sharing. She, uh, three of my children were born while I was overseas, and uh, they uh, uh, were uh, are nice kids and good people, and uh, I would have to say that Kitty is responsible for that. And again, she was accepted what William James said, whatever it is, it is. And uh, she made the best of it. She made uh, two trips to the East Coast when our ship was coming in. And the last time during the Korean War, she uh, had uh, four children and she drove out there and, uh, and uh, met the ship, and uh, that's just the kind of person she is, and she's still that kind of person. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted that I've had these wonderful 62 years, and my children and her eight grandchildren uh, feel the same way I do about her. Where did she live while you were overseas? Was she living in, with her parents? Or? Well, she lived with her parents, and she stayed with uh, uh, my parents down in Moultrie sometime, and uh, she uh, and we had a house uh, when I was called back to Korea in Wake Forest, and she stayed there uh, and because her mother and father lived in Raleigh, and Wake Forest was 17 miles from from Raleigh at that time, and uh, she would do that thing. She put those children in the car and there she would go, wherever the ship was coming in. Are you still running cross country yourself? Well, let's call it shuffling. Shuffling. How far do you shuffle? Oh, well, I'm about 
three or four miles a day. And I try to stay out for an hour. And I try to stay out there every day. Good for you. When is the last time you ran a marathon? Well, uh, Louis Felder, my doctor, uh, discovered I had an irregular heartbeat. And he uh, said, uh, you uh, you got to stop running marathons. I said, well, I planned to run that with uh, in 1926. Uh, I said, well, I plan to run the Greek Marathon this year and the 100th anniversary of the Boston Marathon. He said, run the Greek, but don't run anymore. I said, okay. So I went back for my physical the next year. And he said, well, did you go to Greece? I said, yep, yeah, went to Greece. I said, I also ran the Atlanta Mar uh, Marathon three weeks later. And then in April, I ran the 100th anniversary uh, of the Boston Marathon. He said, man, you're blazing, you're going to die. You know, but I can't run fast because I'm on Coumadin and so therefore I, I, I just go at my own pace. But you ran marathons up until you were 75 years old? I celebrated my, I had planned to celebrate my 75th uh, birthday by running in three marathons, including the Greek and the 100th anniversary of Boston. Good for you. So I, I've run several half marathons since then, but no full marathon. What other lasting thoughts would you like to leave for your grandchildren or the people who may see this tape 50 years from now? What, what kind of, you've been imparting lessons to a lot of us for many, many years, so this is your chance to do it on tape and okay. impart one or two more. Well, we, we, are, we are very fortunate have eight healthy grandchildren. The oldest uh, of the grandchildren is uh, finishing up her PhD in audiology so she can do something about my ears uh, in, uh, at Vanderbilt. And the, but the other seven are all boys. And of course, uh, I did not, uh, when Jeff said he wanted to go in the Navy and and uh, in Vietnam, I, uh, I in, encouraged him to, if that's what he wanted to do, that's what he ought to do. But I do have concern, uh, you know, right now, and with all eight of, uh, of seven of, the, of my grandchildren, but it, I have said to this to them many times, and I've said to the students at school, many times. The two most important things for you is to know and understand freedom and understand responsibility. And all of us have that responsibility, I think, to do everything in our power to keep this country free and to do what we have to do in order to keep it and I hope that my grandchildren uh, and my great-grandchildren will be a part of the same kind of tradition that my father, uh, Kitty's father, for instance, was in World War I and World War II. He was a lieutenant colonel and the uh, commanding officer of a prisoner's war camp. So Kitty understood the meaning of this. And I uh, would do the same thing in Satan. Whatever has to be done, as William said, or James said, do it and make the best of it. Well, Elliot, you're one of the legendary people in the Atlantis history, whether you want to admit it or not. And I personally have enjoyed having you be here today at the Atlanta History Center and express my sincere appreciation to you for what you did in World War II to allow me to grow up going to E. River School and Morris Brandon and they got started and for right. all the contributions you made to the educational standards that you've set for everybody here in the city of Atlanta during these past 35 years. Well, thank you very much and it's been a pleasure to hear and I'm so glad we have a place like uh, the Atlanta History Center where you can get things and understand things, and I'm grateful for that.